fucking evidence is the evidence. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's, let's talk about what's in this article from Chris Hedges. On December 24th, and I know most of you have kept up with the Twitter files. Some of you maybe not, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of background. But um, October 24th, 2022, this past October, day before Christmas, Matt Taibbi was in a room, room at a hotel in San Francisco pouring through reports sent to Twitter from an entity called the Foreign Influence Task Force. Now, this is something you and I probably had never heard of. The FITF is an FBI-led interagency task force that forwards moderation requests. What a friendly way of saying censorship. From numerous government agencies, including Homeland Security, the CIA, the Pentagon, the State Department, and a partridge in a pear tree. All to social media outlets. Taibbi was given access to the internal traffic by Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk. It revealed how the FBI and other government agencies routinely suppressed news and commentary. He published a Twitter thread that night, Christmas Eve, with the headline Twitter and other government agencies. Now, I've, re- I've gone through many of his uh, Twitter threads that revealed these type of things, so I'm not going to go through those details. Instead, what this segment that I'm doing now is about is about the actual attacks and I'll show some of the attacks during the congressional testimony in a moment, but some of the attacks that have gone on against the journalist, Matt Taibbi, who dare, dare reveal the truth. None of these documents from internal Twitter, none of them have been questioned. Oh, they were fake. No one's claiming that. They're all they're all true, and they show how Twitter has acted in many ways as an arm of our government. Um, and, you know, and, and some of that may have changed under Musk, but Musk was just awarded a multi, multi million dollar contract with the Pentagon. He has long held connections to the CIA. So I don't know that a lot of it is changing under Musk. Some of it may be. Uh, I know I'm still largely shadow banned over on Twitter. So it's, you know, Randy Credico, a fellow comedian, uh, also was just banned on Twitter. So I don't know uh, uh, really how much has changed, but that's not really the point. The content that was suppressed included right-wing and left-wing reports critical of the dominant narrative advanced by the Democratic Party and the old establishment wing of the Republican Party, which has been folded into the Democratic Party. Threads from the Yellow Vest Movement, activists from Occupy Movement, Global Revolution Live, which, if you don't know about them, they were pivotal in many of the revolutions and uprising around that time of Occupy. They were important also with Occupy. Negative stories about Joe Biden reporting on the Ukrainian energy company Burisma that paid Hunter Biden about a million dollars a year while his father was vice president. Positive stories about Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro were suppressed. Reports about Ukrainian human rights abuses and details of the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop were all of the just a, a tiny portion of the plethora of accounts that were flagged and disappeared. Now, Chris Edges. Uh, then says something that also identically holds true for me. He says, I was a victim of this censorship. The six-year archive of my show on Contact, broadcast on RT America, was erased from YouTube, although not one show was about Russia and none violated YouTube's content guidelines. All of my shows erased as well. Uh, Most of you know that. And my entire channel banned around the world. But so let's get back to Taibbi. So Taibbi goes in front of Congress and he uh, he tells them basically what was in the Twitter file, tries to tell them what was in the Twitter files. But all the Democrats uh, with to 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 every single one, not not a single Democrat stood up and defended Taibbi's right to publish true journalism. All of them just went after him in a variety of ways, some of which I'm going to get to in a moment. But Taibbi said, my understanding is that the FITF has a staff of at least 80. Uh, That's the FBI interagency task force. It consists primarily of the FBI, but it also includes people from the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Requests that came from the states went through DHS. Department of Homeland Security requests that came from the federal government went through the FBI. They went through a program called Teleporter. That's how we got those documents. So all of this should horrify you, right? The idea that our government tells Twitter what is allowable in the public sphere, all of that should should, should make, make veins pop out in your neck 
the way they do on me. It should absolutely infuriate you. But then on top of just that existing, this establishment, this system, this this the loose conglomeration of ghouls and, and serpents that represents our government, have it's not just that they did that, it's that they now need to try and destroy the life of the journalist or the journalists that reveal this type of thing. So in March, Taibi and Michael Schellenberger were called to testify before the select subcommittee on weaponization of the federal government. While Taibi was testifying on March 9th, an IRS agent visited his health house in New Jersey. So as Taibi is testifying in front of Congress, they're sending, the government is sending IRS agents to his house to scare him, to silence him. Now, ostensibly to find something wrong that he's done in his taxes. But even if that's all they do, even if the, old, the sole goal was to uh, re- 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 find flaws in Taibi's taxes, why do that on the day he's testifying? Why do that at all at the time that he's uh, sp- revealing the, that, that Twitter and other social media platforms are an arm of our government? Are, uh, of course, it's politically based. I mean, anyone who could come to any other conclusion that clearly the IRS is being used as a weapon, as a tool by the ruling elite. Uh, I don't know that that's exclusively the Biden administration. It could go far beyond the Biden administration into deep state actors. But whatever, it's being used as a tool, as a weapon by our government to to harm people, to threaten people, to scare people. Taibbi discovered that the IRS opened a case against him on the day he published, first published on Christmas Eve 2022. So he published his report, IRS opens a file. He goes to testify in front of Congress, they arrive at his house. Those are the two key dates in the IRS investigation into him. Um, <clears throat> he found that out from a letter uh, by House Judiciary Age Chair Jim Jordan, a letter that Jim Jordan sent to, and Jim Jordan is a right wing, you know, fucking prick, but on this, in this regard, he's correct. In this regard, he's doing the right thing, which is to find out why the IRS is being used as a weapon against a journalist. So whether you like Jim Jordan or not is not really the point. So he sent a letter to IRS Commissioner Daniel Werfel inquiring about Taibbi's case. It was a Saturday. It was Christmas Eve. Taibbi did not owe taxes. The case was four years old. It was from 2018. All this suggests that the IRS case was clearly politically motivated. So then they begin the character assassination against Taibbi. And I want to play for you. We'll watch together. Debbie Wasserman Schultz goes out of her way to try and harm the legitimacy of Taibi, as did many of them. But Schultz is perhaps one of the most hilarious, watching her do it as one of the most, uh, one of the most um, corrupt officials that we have in government. I mean, after we saw what she did with the, the helping to rig the primaries against Bernie Sanders, et cetera. But anyway... Um, Let's watch some of this. And a great, great point. I now recognize the gentlelady from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Taibbi, I, I want to ask about journalistic ethics and information sources. The Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics asserts that journalists should avoid political activities that can compromise integrity or credibility. Being a Republican witness today certainly casts a cloud over your ob- objectivity. So apparently, according to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, no one is allowed to be a witness in front of testimony and call themselves a journalist. No one. Because if, test- if you're testifying for the Democrats, then you're on the Democrats side testifying because the Republicans called him. Then it, apparently that taints you. So according to her worldview, what she would view as legit or virtuous is no one ever going to testify in front of Congress and calling themselves a journalist. Now, other people could go testify, but they would have to admit that they are also corrupted because they've been called to testify. Like, that's legit what she just said. You have been called by Republicans to testify. That taints you as a journalist and your ethics. Therefore, zero witnesses ever brought in front of Congress 
can be considered legit. So by her worldview, Congress would just never learn anything from witnesses. Sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds wonderful. I mean, how sick is that? But a deeper concern that I have relates to the ethics of how journalists receive and present certain information. Journalists should avoid accepting spoon-fed, cherry-picked information if it's likely to be slanted, incomplete, or designed to reach a foregone, easily disputed, or invalid conclusion. Would you agree with that? An easily disputed, foregone conclusion? How exactly has this one been disputed? These emails and, and other forms of correspondence that have been revealed with the Twitter files are not disputed. They're absolutely legit. And... He wasn't given uh, he wasn't given spoon fed data. He was given all of the thousands of pages of interaction connected to this. What were the initials again? I F T T I T T I uh, the uh, the F I T F. So he was Twitter gave him Elon Musk and Twitter gave him thousands of documents connected to that interagency bureau that were sent to Twitter to to suppress things. That's not cherry picking data. That's giving you all of the data. Of course, he's not going to give them every every document that's ever existed. Spoon fed, cherry picked. Promotes a slanted viewpoint or at the very least generates another right wing conspiracy theory. You violate it. Generates a right-wing conspiracy theory. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is a conspiracy with accurate proof that we've all seen that no one has claimed that it's not real. Again, very similar to WikiLeaks, very similar to Assange. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz, much like the primary evidence that she, that she and others rigged uh, in 2016 and then to a different degree in 2020, um... They, they can't actually answer the evidence. They can't face the evidence. They can't address the evidence. So they just go after the idea that the evidence is evidence at all and the idea that Matt Taibbi should exist as a human being. Like, that's all they can do. It's, uh, this is Clinton Machine 101. Your own standard, and you appear to have benefited from it. Before the release of emails in, of the emails in August of last year, you had 661,000 Twitter followers. After the Twitter files, your followers doubled, and now it's three times what it was last August. This is another tactic that's used against anyone who ever reveals anything. Well, did you, did you achieve any fame or success or money from... Yeah. Generally speaking, just about anyone who reveals anything will achieve one of those things if you do it well. Like, and they're not going to come after those who don't achieve those things. So basically, so, so as if there's some way for Matt Taibbi to have revealed mass government collusion to censor and ban profiles across Twitter and not have gained in the public eye, either fame or money or Twitter followers or, and, and even if he did it for those reasons, let's say, and I don't think this is who Matt Taibbi is, but let's say he did. Let's say he was just like, you know what? I'm, I would never put in this amount of work. I would never work to write these articles or anything, except that I really love money and I really love Twitter followers. And so I can get those two things. Let's say that was his goal. Still, the fucking evidence is the evidence. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, I, that's what I love when people like... It's like, like I had to deal with this endlessly when I had a show at RT. Now, I haven't been at RT for over a year. So uh, anyone who wants to accuse me of that shit, you can stop. Uh, but when I was when I redacted the night at RT, which has now been banned globally, uh, I had to deal with this endlessly. Like, wh well, your segment on how uh, Cargill or Monsanto or something killed the 100,000 people. Uh, you, you, don't you work at RT? Isn't dad done Russia create RT America? And it's like, well, okay. Do, and, and is anything I said incorrect? Did I, can you not look at the sources I referenced? Can you not look up your own sources and see that what I'm saying is true about Roundup herbicide or whatever? Can you not like, okay. So am I lying to you? Well, no, I'm not saying you are. Okay. So everything I've said is true. Everything I've said is accurate, but 
it just, but it has a funny color name in the corner. Ah! It's like, dude. Uh, so Taibi was informed that there was problems with his 2018 tax return, right? Um, it, Taibi then says, why would an IRS agent need to know anything about my professional history? Oh, uh, sorry. I, I skipped the part where it, they found out that the IRS had gone through everything about Taibi. They had his voter registration records, whether he possessed a hunting or fishing license, whether he had a concealed weapons permit, his telephone numbers, articles he had written, articles written about him. This is all for apparently an IRS case that has nothing to do with him revealing the Twitter files, right? Right, right. Why would an IRS agent, this is a quote from Taibi, why would an IRS agent need to know anything about my professional history or about controversies that I've been involved with or things that I had written about? That seems pretty dubious. They're not worried about the optics, about doing something like sending an IRS agent to the home of a journalist who has a big platform and a reputation for not being afraid to say something about it. They're not worried about how this looks. It is concerning for a number of reasons. It reminds you of things you would see in a third world country. It really is pretty horrifying how, how like the lack of fear, the lack of, of, of any kind of concern that persecuting a journalist would look bad, could be bad, could be bad for our government. I mean, these are the type of activities that Nixon resigned over. I mean, Watergate and other associated activities like having a, a, a list of enemies that he was breaking in and trying to learn information about them. They notoriously broke into Daniel Elber Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to try and get data on uh, personal data on Ellsberg. Well, this sounds very similar. Sending the IRS, weaponizing the IRS to go after a journalist to try and find out, hey, maybe he's got a psychiatrist. Maybe he's got some mental health problems we can exploit. Um, so Chris Hedges continues, there are three steps to destroying a reporter who can't be bought off or intimidated. The first is a campaign by the powerful whose lies and crimes have been exposed along with their obsequious courtiers in the press to discredit the reporting. The second is a sustained campaign of character assassination. The third is persecution carried out once the reporter's credibility has been weakened. His or her ability to publish or broadcast is degraded and public support has eroded. And that's really interesting is that this is a multi-step pro uh, process that they use against journalists who are revealing things they don't like. And one of those steps is to tar and feather their their brand, you know, destroy their brand so that a Seymour Hirsch or a Matt Taibbi or a Chris Hedges uh, is no longer looked upon, Glenn Greenwald, no longer looked upon as a legitimate journalist. And of course, Julian Assange no longer looked upon as a legitimate publisher. And once they've achieved that, once the popular perception of an Assange, for example, is, oh, he's a terrible guy, he's a dickhead, he's a liar, he's a fraud, he's just out for attention, he's, he's uh, you know, all those rape, not all those, there were two rape charges that have been completely debunked and dropped. Um, and all of that is designed to make his... Uh, the, how people view of him, view of him, the, the his brand, b b just totally degraded. And once they're at that point, then they can go after him in a more substantial way, uh, actually persecuting that person because they know there won't be enough uh, uh, people backing him up because they've already made him look like an evildoer for lack of a better world, better world. They've made him look like a snake. And so therefore who's going to stand up for a snake. And for those who do stand up for the snake, uh, they are easily refuted because there'll be a million people on Twitter going, how dare you stand up for a rapist? How dare you stand up for a liar? So this is a multi-step process and, you know, let's hope they don't keep going after Taibi, but Hedges continues, this is what happened to Julian Assange. It happened to, uh, before Assange, it happened to Don Hollenbeck, IF Stone, Gary Webb, who I mentioned a couple of live streams ago, who uh, apparently murdered himself with two, not one, but two shots to the head. 
Ray Bonner, and many others. It is what is happening to Taibbi, whose revelations of widespread censorship by the FBI, the CIA, Homeland Security, and other intelligence and government agencies have enraged the ruling class. The concerted attacks on Taibbi are an example of how the walls are steadily closing in to impose an iron conformity, one more piece of our emergent corporate totalitarianism. Uh, so great article by Chris Hedges. Feel free to check it out. It's over at Shear Post. Uh, ironically, Ro uh, 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 Robert Shear, who I've also worked for Shear Post. Uh, I've posted some things for them. Um, Robert Shear, epic journalist, uh, epic reporter, something like 30 years at the LA Times. He's been with various, outlet, various outlets, Ramparts Magazine, uh, broke countless stories. He is now, much like Seymour Hirsch, he's had to create his own out outlet, Shear Post, because he can't, uh, they, they won't have him in the mainstream media. He's 80 some years old, um, but they, the mainstream media won't have these journalists who are known as epic, epic journalists, Chris Hedges, Seymour Hirsch, Robert Shear, because there is no mainstream media that's actually adversarial to our government any longer. 